Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. The easiest DIY button box you will ever build. Play a guarantee. Coming up on today's episode of 2020 Flight Simmers. Welcome back. In today's video, we will do a complete DIY button box build from start to finish. This will consist of push buttons, toggles, and encoders. We will first start by going over all of the hardware that we're going to be using in today's build, as well as all the links will be down in the description. No affiliation. We will then construct and assemble our switch panel, followed by all the wiring. And lastly, if there is any programming necessary, we'll get into that. If you have any comments or questions throughout the video, post it down below in the comments section and I'll get right back with you. If you enjoyed today's content and find it useful, make sure to hit that subscribe, tick on that little bell, and smash that thumbs up button. It is greatly appreciated. All right, so let's jump right into all the hardware that we're gonna be using for today's video. Reminder, all of the links for these will be down below in the description. On your screen right now, you will see the website for Leo Bodner. That is the location of where I purchased the board from. Now you can also purchase encoders and switches from there as well, However, a little bit more expensive, but I feel probably more quality parts. Now, there are some perks to purchasing the encoders from Leo Bodner as opposed to Amazon, so let's go over that real quick. In the box, I have all the hardware that we're going to be using on today's build. The first thing I want to go over are the encoders that we're going to be using on the build. Now, before I get into this, for those of you who are unsure of what an encoder is, as opposed to a potentiometer. An encoder is something that you would find on the GNS 530, the G1000, or even the Bravo throttle quadrant. So basically an encoder will spin continuously in a 360 degree rotation. And a potentiometer is something that you would find on an axis, like your throttle, your pitch, and your mixture. The first encoder that I wanna go over is the one that can be purchased on the Leo Bodner website. Now this is going to be the easiest encoder to connect up to your board, and I will get into the connection a little bit later. The next encoder that you can find would be on Amazon. Now these will come in a pack of five, I believe, for about $10. So for the price, uh, you really can't beat that. Now one thing that you will notice differently on this encoder as opposed to the other encoder from Leo Bodner is this one actually has a pinout on the bottom of the encoder. So that means that we're going to need to create a wiring harness such as this to be able to connect the board to the main power board or our motherboard that's going to control everything. The next thing we're going to install is a toggle switch. Now for this, I chose mini toggles. Now this will apply to any other larger toggles as well. The reason why I chose this one is for ease of installation. As you see on the bottom of this toggle switch, we already have soldered on positive and negative wire. So that will be very helpful when we're connecting everything. The next item that we will install is gonna be a push button. Again, this push button already has soldered on wiring to make it very simple for connection to our board. And lastly, to make everything work, we're going to need a main control board. Now for this, we are using the Leo Bodner BBI 32 button box interface with push connections on the board. So basically all we need to do to connect anything is just push in these little push pins and then stick your wire in the respective slot. That's it. Okay, so that was all the hardware we're gonna be using for today's build. Let's go over some of the tools that we're gonna need. First, we're gonna need a pair of side cutters. We will also need a pair of crimpers if you're gonna be using the Amazon encoders. We will need a pair of wire strippers, and I also have a pair of needle nose pliers. I will also be using a very inexpensive soldering iron. Now for this, you don't necessarily have to have the best soldering iron. Now don't worry, for those of you who are not soldering literate, that's okay. We're only gonna be using the soldering iron to tin the end of our wires. If you don't know what that means, I will get into that a little bit later. Now, along with the soldering iron, we're also gonna need some solder as well as some flux. And as you can see here, this is from Radio Shack. Why does Radio Shack ask for your phone number when you buy batteries? 
don't know. We will also be using a hot glue gun. Again, these are very inexpensive. A couple drill bits that we will use to drill our holes. The first drill bit is a 17 64th. The second drill bit is a one quarter. And the last drill bit is a half. Now, for those of you who will be using the encoders from Amazon, it would also be a good idea for you to pick up a pack of these. What this will give you is all of the different pins and different connectors that we're going to need to insert those pins and make our own wiring harness. Oh, and one last thing, you may want to pick up some ribbon cable. Again, links I'll post down below in the description. All right, so now I know everybody's asking, what about the button box? Well, in the theme of keeping this as easy as possible, I chose to go a little bit different route. Now, I know sometimes building a box can be a little difficult for some people and not so difficult for others. There's a couple things that I want to go over first before I show you what I'm going to be using. To create a button box, we first have to think about how thick the material needs to be or can be to insert our switch. If we take a look at the switches, we need to measure the entire thread length. And then you also want to make sure that you have enough thread left to get your nut back on the switch. Most of these switches will only accommodate up to about a three millimeter thick piece of material. So a couple options that you could use here. One, you could go to Home Depot or Lowe's or any of your hardware stores and pick up a thin piece of plexiglass. You may also want to take your switch with you and hold it up to the plexiglass to see if you have a thin enough piece to be able to use. You could also create a box out of wood, take a piece of plexiglass and put on top to have your switches come through. You could also 3D print yourself a switch panel and insert your switches that way. But we are not doing any of that today. I wanted to keep this so simple that you can go and start building your box right now. So let me show you what we're gonna do and we're gonna head to the kitchen. So come along with me. Heading off to the kitchen. That'll do. All right, so now that we have our Tupperware container that we're gonna be using for today's build, there's a couple things that we wanna look out for when you're choosing your container of choice. Now, number one, we wanna make sure that we have a good flat surface, at least on one side of the container. The other thing is we wanna make sure of the thickness. So we can hold our button or switch up to the container and we can clearly see we will have plenty of space to attach this. The next thing is we want to make sure that the plastic we're using is hard. If you have a Tupperware container that you can squeeze, well, when you go to push the buttons or switch the switches, it's going to flex on you. So those are just a couple things that we want to keep an eye out for. We need the material rigid enough to hold the switches but not too thick that our switches can't be screwed onto. The next thing that we need to do is to think about the button layout for your switch panel. Now, a good rule of thumb here is to prototype. So get yourself a piece of cardboard and draw out a layout of how you would want the buttons to go. Then we can drill holes in our cardboard, insert all the switches, and then you can run through the switches, flicking on and off, turning the encoders, making sure that you have enough space between the switches and encoders for your liking. Once you have that done, then you can take the template that you have just made in cardboard, and then you can tape it over top of your Tupperware container. Now that you have it taped, you can then take your drill bits that you use to make those holes and just simply drill right through the same hole that is in the cardboard. Now, for the sake of time in making this video, I am not gonna be doing any sort of templates what I'm going to do is just drill some holes in here and hope for the best. But when you're putting a lot of time into this, you really want to make sure that you test, test, test before you drill into your main material. So let's do that right now. All right, there we go. There's our first hole so we can test. And the hole is just a little bit undersized. so. Let's egg that out a little bit. All right, so what I'll do now is I'll place my first encoder there and I'll just stick it in the hole so I can see just how far away it's gonna be from my second encoder. We'll now drill the hole for the second encoder right next to it. 
for those of you who are purchasing the encoders from the Leo Bodner website, you may have a difficult time trying to get the knob off of the encoder. When you get the encoder, you will have a cap on the front of that knob. You want to pop the cap off, and inside you will have a little nut. I use a pair of needle nose, and I just loosen that nut, and the knob comes right off. Now, let's make a couple holes for our switches. Lastly, what I want to do is create a hole in the bottom for the USB cable to connect to the board. So I'm just going to drill into the bottom with my half inch drill bit, and hopefully that'll be enough. Now, as far as attaching the board, well, you can get creative. So what I was going to do is just put a little bit of hot glue under the board, and then we can have it attached right to where that hole is so we can connect our USB. Now, because I'm going to be using this board in my personal build, I am not going to hot glue this down, but that would be just a simple option to keep that in place. Now that we have our switch and button attached to the top, let's now defer our attention to the encoders. On the back of the Leo encoder, you can see that we have everything labeled for ground, the push button when we push in on the encoder, and then when we're turning the encoder left, and when we're turning the encoder right. So basically, anytime that we turn this encoder left or right, it will respond as a button click in either direction. So then we're just gonna map whatever we want to that button click. We'll get into that later. Now, if you take a look at the Amazon board that we have, not only do we have to create a wiring harness, but we also have an extra wire that we need to connect. So we have five wires going to this and only four going to the Leo. The fifth wire that we need to connect to this is a five volt power source. So this board requires its own power source to run. If you're going to use the Amazon encoder, there is going to be one extra step that you're going to need to do to the board. I only chose to show you this, and that's because these are so readily available, and I'm sure I would have plenty of questions. If we take a look at this board, on the very bottom of the board here, we have a 5 volt pin, and we have two ground pins. From Leo Bodner, these pins are not attached to the board. I had to solder these onto the board myself so that I can connect my 5 volt power source to the encoder from Amazon. If you're going to be using the encoders from Leo Bodner, then you do not, repeat, you do not have to install these pins on the bottom of this board because there is no 5 volt input on this. These are so easy to hook up, it's gonna blow your mind. So I have already pre-installed these pins so that I can show you how to connect the encoder. Okay, so now we have all of our buttons, switches, and encoders mounted to our button box. Now what we need to do is to wire everything up to the board. Now before we do this, we're gonna jump back onto the Leo Bodner website because they have a good bit of documentation on how to do all of this. So let's jump over to the website real quick. Taking a look at the screen, we're on the BBI32 button box interface. We're going to head down to how to use. If we scroll down here, we are able to connect all of these buttons and switches up two different ways. One way that we can connect all of these switches and buttons up to the board is connecting them individually to the board. So if we take a look at the screen on the left hand side, it will show each switch independently getting connected to the board, positive and negative, or positive and ground. You can also do this another fashion by connecting all of your grounds together in a daisy chain method and only connecting one ground to the board. Now that ground can essentially be placed in any of the ground pins and then all of your positive pins, which we're gonna use for our red wires, will then get connected into the respective slot. So if we take a look at the right side of the board, we start off with B1 and ground, B2 and ground, B3 and ground, and so on. On the other side of the board, it reverses. So we have ground and B17, ground and B18, ground and B19, and so on. Now, for those of you who are gonna be using encoders, 
if we scroll down just a little bit more on this screen, we can see how to connect a rotary encoder. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, wait a minute, the encoder that I see on the screen only has three wires going into it. And that's because the encoder portion of the switch itself only needs three wires. You need your ground, you need a right-hand turn and a left-hand turn. But why does ours have that fourth? Well, that's because you have the push button. So on the encoder, we can push in on the encoder and that is gonna require an extra wire that's gonna be wired into a button port on the board. So now that we have gone over how these can be wired up, now let's go ahead and start wiring these to our board. Now, before we start wiring up any of the buttons, switches, or encoders, you also need to know one more thing about the encoders. And that is the encoders need to start at the lowest button number on the board. So we need to start connecting all the encoders starting at B1 and so on, until all the encoders are connected to the board and then you can put any button anywhere else on the board. It's only the encoders that we need to make sure we start off at the lowest input first. So because of that, I like to do everything in order. So we're gonna start off with the encoder wiring first, and then we'll move on to the buttons. Now these wires already come pre-tinned on the ends. So if you take a look at the end of this wire, it already has solder put on that wire. Same with any of these switches that we installed, the ends are already tinned. So for those of you who are not buying switches that already have your wires tinned on the ends or need to extend those wires, let me show you how to tin the end of your wire. It's very simple and doesn't take nearly any experience to do this. You're gonna take your wire strippers, strip some wire. We will then twist that wire up so it looks like that, then, We'll take our Radio Shack Flux. Now what Flux does is it helps the solder disperse. So if you don't put Flux on your wiring, the solder will not embed or permeate all of the wire fibers. So we're going to just dunk it into the Flux. Soldering iron was already preheated. We'll get a little bit of solder, let me get the board out of there. We'll get a little bit of solder on the tip of our, of our iron and then just touch the wire. And as you can see, we have now tinned the end of that wire. Now the act of tinning the wire will not only make it stronger, but it will keep the wire from fraying. And that's really important when you're gonna be inserting this wire into the breakout board here, is we don't want any frayed wires potentially going and shorting out on another wire. So this will prevent any of that from happening and also make it pretty stiff to be able to push in the connector itself. That is pretty much all the soldering that you're gonna to need to do for this build. And that's only if you're gonna be extending these wires or using your own switches without the wires already soldered on. So now that we have all of our wires tinned to all of our button switches and encoders, we can start connecting everything up to the board. So the first wire that we're gonna be connecting here is the ground pin on the Leo Bodner encoder. And if we take a look at the board, we're gonna be using the smallest side first. So the very first pin is gonna be our B1. The second pin is gonna be ground. So we are gonna stick the ground wire in the ground push terminal. And that's it. So you just push in that terminal with a screwdriver, a small screwdriver, and then push your wire in and that's it. Now, one thing you do wanna make sure of is when you are tinning these wires that you don't put an excessive amount of flux on the wire because what'll happen is all that flux is gonna melt and wind up dripping down. So if you accidentally do, just wipe the wire, wipe the flux off of the wire after you've tinned it. The next wire in sequence is gonna be the push button. Now for this, the push button is acting as a simple toggle switch or a push button like we have mounted on the front. Because of that, we need to keep this separate from the other two encoder wires that we have here. Remember I said all the encoders need to be placed at the very beginning of this board and then work our way down. 
So we're going to save the push button part of this for after we have all the encoders installed. So we will move on to the next wire in sequence, and that's going to be the encoder B. We're going to wire this into the B1 slot on the board. There we go. The next is going to be encoder A, and we're going to put this into the B2 slot on the board. So that's how we're going to wire up our first encoder. We have our left turn or right turn. We have our ground pin in the center to the ground. And then the last positive, which would be either our left turn or right turn, in the next B2 terminal. The next encoder that we're going to be wiring up today is the Amazon encoder. Now for this, you will need to make up your own wiring harness. That will then plug right into the bottom of the switch. And now we can wire this up directly to the board. Before I wire this up to the board, I would first like to show you how to use the crimping tool to crimp your terminals on the end here. Now I'm not gonna go through all of them. We're just gonna do one so you get the idea. For this, we're gonna use the same yellow wire that I had tinned earlier. However, we do not need to tin the wire when we're going to be using the crimping tool. So I'll just go on the other end here and we're going to strip this back a little bit. Again, we will use our wire strippers. For a crimp connector, we only need a very little bit of wire showing out of there. Now that might only be about five or six millimeters of bare wire coming out the end. You want to make sure that you spin the wire and twist all the little frays together. And then we're going to grab one of our little connectors here. And that is what the connector looks like. Then we'll grab the crimping tool. We'll take our connector and I'm going to set it right in the back of the tool. Now this tool is used for two different size crimp connectors. I'm just going to crimp it in there just slightly to hold it in place. Next, I'm going to take the end of this and we're going to place it inside the little crimp connector. This is going to be very touch sensitive. And what I mean by that is you don't want to insert this wire too far because then what can happen is you will get the insulation in the crimp and not the bare wire in the crimp. So when I say it's touch sensitive, you can't actually see where the wire is. You've got a feel for when it hits a little stop on the inside. So if we take a look at the crimp connection now, you can see that the insulation portion of the wire is butted up against this little crimp connection right here. That is where the bare part of the wire should be. If you pull this out of your crimping tool and you see that your insulation is in this part of the crimp, pull that thing off and redo it. Then all you need to do is to get the appropriate connector and then just slide this right in to the back and that's it. All right, so now that we have all of our connections crimped, we have our connector onto the encoder. Now we need to wire this up to the board. Now remember, this one is also going to get a 5 volt power source for that board. So for that, we also need to wire up a crimp connection on the end of that so that we can plug that in to our pins that we have soldered onto the board. Now we want to take a look at the board. The 5 volt pin is all the way on the right hand side here. Well, we can just do it this way. There we go. So now we have our five volt wired to the board. And now we can start wiring everything else. So the first thing we'll do is we'll wire up the ground. Ground is black. We need to put this in the next slots that we have available that are not being used for the previous encoder. So again, if we take a look at this board, you can see that we have B1 and ground taken up and B2 and we have nothing in the ground for B2. That's okay because that is all set up for the first encoder. Now we need to set up the second encoder. 
The second encoder, we're now going to move to the next grouping of numbers, and that would be B3 and ground. So we will put the ground pin in the B3 ground slot. The next wire that we'll wire up is either going to be our right or left hand turn on the encoder. On the board, it's going to be labeled either CLK or DT. So let's wire up CLK first, and that is going to be our blue wire. Now for this wire, we're going to connect this to the B3 terminal. Come on. There we go. <clears throat> the next wire we're going to wire up is the purple, and that's going to go to the opposite turning direction. Again, we're going to wire that up to the very next positive terminal that we have available on the board. So that is going to be B4. There we go. So if we take a look at the board, we have the first three encoder wires connected, positive ground positive, and we have the second round of encoder connected, positive ground positive. It does look like all the laser etchings do line up perfectly with the corresponding pins, and that'll help keep everything in order for us. So now that you have all of your encoders wired up, now what we're going to do is connect all of the push buttons for those encoders. So we'll start with the Amazon encoder first, and the push button on this encoder is going to be the gray wire leading to the SW pin, which is the switch. The pin that we're going to use to connect the gray wire is going to be the next positive pin in sequence. So if we take a look at the board, the very last pin that we use was B4 positive, then we have ground, and now we have B5 positive. That's the pin that we're going to use for the push button. The reason why we do not need to wire up a ground to this is because we've already tied in the ground to the switch. As long as there is one ground to that switch, that's all we need. And I call it a switch, but it's an encoder. The next push button that we're going to wire up is on the Leo Bodner encoder, and that's going to be our blue wire coming from the push on the switch. Now again, we'll go back to the board and we'll find the very next positive input on the board. The last positive input we used here is B5. The next input is ground, so we need to skip that. The next positive would be B6. That's where we're going to connect the push button to the Leo Bodner encoder. Okay, so as you can see here, we have skipped the ground pin for B5, and we've inserted the Leo Bodner switch to the encoder into B6 and that is going to control the push button on the encoder. All right, great. So you have just wired up your first encoders on the Leo board. Now we can wire up all of our toggle switches and push buttons. Now remember, there's two different ways in which we can wire these up, and we'll go over both of them now. The first way to wire all of your switches up is to wire up an individual ground and an individual positive to every switch. So how we would do that is we will go to our board. We are going to find the next pair of open inputs. Because we're using B6, we're going to then move to B7 on our board. We'll then push in the push pin for ground. And then we're going to insert the positive. When you insert your wires, you want to make sure that you do not have any bare wires sticking out of the terminal. If you do, 
then you need to cut some of that wire off so you can stick it down in further into the hole because you don't want anything shorting out on each other. Now for this build, this is probably how I would wire it up just because it's a very simple two button build. However, when you start getting into a 64, 100 buttons on your switch panel, well then wiring up a separate ground for every switch becomes a little monotonous. So let me go into the optional way in which we can wire this up. The optional way to wire these up would be to daisy chain all of the grounds together, meaning I would take this ground and wire it to that switch and then so on and so forth. And then at the very end, you would take that last wire and connect it to your ground pin. Now for this, I'm going to do this a little bit differently. I'm going to twisty these together and I'm going to take our yellow wire that we had created earlier and I'm just going to wire that one to all the grounds. This is essentially doing the same thing as daisy chaining all of these together. I will go to the next pair of open inputs that we have, which is B7. I'm going to then insert the ground and that's it. You don't need to wire up any of your other grounds for your push buttons and switches because they're all wired in series. Now with that being said, because they're wired in series, if either of these wires come apart, just like with your Christmas lights when you pull the bulb out and the whole thing went dead, well that's essentially what would happen here. If one of these come free or break loose, then all of the switches prior to that break will be dead. They will not work. So there are pros and cons to doing this method. We now need to wire up our second switch. Again, we'll move to the second pair of open terminals, which is going to be our B8 and ground. Now, because we've already daisy chained all of our grounds together, we only need to insert the positive into the B8 slot. And that's pretty much everything wired up to the board. Now, for sake of demonstration, I'm not going to leave these grounds connected like this because it's not a really good thing to do. So what I'm going to do is just wire up each of the switches independently to the board like I showed you in the first connection. So we take a look here. We have B8 and ground and B7 and ground, and that is going to be for our two switches. Again, you really want to make sure that you do not have any fray or any wire sticking up above these terminals because you do not want anything to short out. So I can't stress that enough. All right, now that we have everything wired up to our board, we can connect the last encoder. We can insert this into our box, put all the wiring in. This would be hot glued down so it wouldn't be going anywhere. Now let me get the USB cable. Okay, so before we go any further, I just want to touch on why I chose the Leo board over your more traditional methods like an Arduino. The first reason is simple, and that's ease of use. When you're using an Arduino board, we need to program the Arduino. And that can be done a couple different ways. We can either use the Mobi Flight application to program the Arduino, in which cases you're now going to be tied to MobiFlight any time that you want to bind anything to that board or to those buttons. The other way that which we can do this is to use the Arduino code and we can use the keyboard library, the joystick library, and create our own script to tell the Arduino what we want it to do with what we have connected to it. Either of those two ways are going to take more learning on your part and more fiddling around to get everything just perfect. And I really wanted to keep this as simple as possible. And with the Leo Bodner board, it will literally show up in Windows as a game controller. Because it's showing up as a game controller, that means it can be used with any game, any simulator that you're able to bind buttons to. Now, if you're wanting to have LED displays or your navigation radio frequencies to be displayed on a little LED, then you're going to need an Arduino for that. 
But if you don't need any of that, and you just need to connect encoders, button switches, things like that, the Leo Bodner board is the easiest that I've come across. Now that we have everything connected in our box, the next thing we need to do is to go back on the Leo Bodner website and download any software we need to program the encoders. Now don't get too worried here when I say programming because it is nowhere near what you have to do with an Arduino. The programming on this is going to be as simple as one click with your mouse. I'll show you what I'm talking about here. All right, so let's take a look back on the screen. We're on the Leo Bodner website on the 32 BBI button box interface. And we're going to go down to product downloads. Once on the product downloads, all of the downloads for this board will be under the product downloads section. So in this section, we have encoder configuration software. We have specific firmware files. We also have a way to rename the firmware. And they also give us a PCB template in the DXF format. So if you're going to be custom designing a case using CAD software, they give you all of the information that you need to do that. But for today's demonstration, all we need to download from this page is the encoder configuration software. It's the only thing we need to configure is the encoders. So you'll click on the encoder download. Once that downloads, you want to go ahead and unzip the file. Now that we have that extracted, we can go ahead and open the file. This is the configuration software that we need to program our encoders. Now, like I said, this is going to be as simple as a one-click operation. So let me show you how that's going to work. The first thing we need to do is to connect our board to our USB. Now, I'm not going to connect the USB to our computer yet. I'm only connecting the USB to the board. All right, there we go. So we have the USB connected to the board, and now I'm going to connect it into our PC. All right, so for your first time opening the application, all of your settings or all of the drop downs on the left hand side here will all be set to the off position. This is where we're going to set the encoder locations on the board. So basically, we just need to tell the board where there is an encoder plugged into it. So now what we need to do is to program and tell the board where the encoders are located. Now, as you remember, when we were connecting everything, we started off at B1 for the first encoder, and then B3 and B4 was the second encoder. Go to the drop downs on the left hand side. We'll find B1 and B2. We'll click on the drop down, and we'll select a one to one ratio. So for these encoders, they are a one to one pulse ratio. So we're just going to set these both to one to one on our first and second encoder. All right, so now that the board knows exactly where your encoders are located, now we need to set the pulse width on the encoders. What the pulse width is going to do is tell the board how far between each of the detents the encoder is. Now, I know that might sound a little bit confusing to try to figure out, but it's actually pretty simple, and let me show you how we do that. We go down to the pulse width section, and what I'm going to do, just for sake of demonstration, I'm going to turn the pulse width way down and show you what happens. Now on the right-hand side, we'll list all of our buttons on the board when they're being pressed. So what I'm going to do now is spin the Amazon encoder. Now, as you can see, I'm spinning this pretty fast. And we're only getting a single button press on the screen. Now, if I go to the Leo Bodner encoder, you can see on the screen, the button presses are actually a little bit more rapid than on the Amazon encoder. Now, that's the next caveat to using this board for encoders. And that is you want to make sure that all of your encoders are the exact same. And that's because we cannot set a different pulse width between the different encoders. So if this encoder has a pulse width of 100 and this one has a pulse width of 60, there's no way that you can get both of them to act properly with this one board. So just keep that in mind when you're picking out your hardware for this. So if you go with the Leo Bodner encoders, use all Leo Bodner encoders. So now what we're going to do is we are going to systematically 
go to the very next pulse width that we have available. Again, we'll rotate the encoder and look at our screen. We can actually see that it is a little bit more responsive now. So essentially, we will then continue going up in the line here, choosing the next available pulse width that we have until we get to a point to where now when we turn the encoder, you can actually see every detent being a button push on the screen. So now let's go ahead and test the buttons on the encoder. So we'll press in. There we go. There's our first button lit up. We'll press a second encoder. That lights up. We'll also use our push button. And now our toggle. So you need to make sure you have the toggle in the right direction for when you want it on and off. So now that you have your encoders configured in the software, that's it. You do not need the software anymore. We can now just exit out of the software. Okay, so now let me show you how this is gonna work in Windows. So if you go to your devices, in your devices for your gaming controllers, you can see right here, we have a button box game controller. That is gonna be for our Leo board. Now also keep in mind with these boards, is you can have multiple boards set up. Each board has its own serial number. So when you map any buttons to that board, it will remain on that board as far as you're mapping. So if you're using SPAD or FSUIPC, or heck, even the NSIM keybinds, whenever you connect to that board, it will automatically bring up all of your keybinds again for that board. So all we're gonna need to do is to right click on the game controller, and then go to the game controller settings. Once you have the menu up, we're gonna select the button box game controller, and then we're gonna to go to properties. Now that we're in the properties, we can select the test tab at the very top. There's no configuration on this menu that we need to do. There's no configuration that we need to do here. I'm simply using the test portion so you can see all the buttons operate. So we'll press in on the encoders. As you can see, the button's lighting up on the screen, our toggle, our push button. And if we turn the encoders left or right, you will see the respective buttons pressing on the screen as well. So even if you have the left and right wired up incorrectly, meaning if I turn to the left, the button on the right goes, and if I turn to the right, the button on the left, it really doesn't matter because you're gonna be binding this in Microsoft Flight Simulator or any simulator to the actual button press and not the direction of the turn of the uh, encoder. Okay, so now you can see that everything works on our button box. I guess you wanna see it work in Microsoft Flight Simulator. So let's go ahead and fire up the sim. I'll bring you guys back in just a moment. All right, we're now in Microsoft Flight Simulator in the Cessna 172. Let's zoom in here on the gauge cluster here on the left-hand side. And I think what I wanna do is program the encoders to be able to be used with the heading and maybe the other one for the barrow. So let's go ahead and see how that's gonna work. And then we'll also program the toggle switch for maybe our batteries. So what we need to do is hit escape. We're gonna to go to controls. At the very top, we're gonna to pick the button box interface that we had just created. And then we're gonna search for heading. So we're gonna do the increase heading bug and decrease heading bug. So we'll click on the increase heading bug first, and then we'll click start scanning. There we go. Hit validate. Uh, we'll call this DIY box. Okay, and there we go. So we have set our increase heading bug. We'll now click on decrease, click on start scanning, and we'll turn the encoder to the left to decrease. Validate, and there we go. All right, so now that we have the Amazon encoder program for our heading, now we're gonna use the other encoder to control our barometric pressure. So again, we'll go to search, we'll type in altimeter, We'll select increase altimeter and then select, whoop, and then we'll hit start scanning, turn the encoder to the right, hit validate, and now we'll decrease, start scanning, turn to the left, 
validate, and we're all set to go. Now, the other thing we can do here is set the push buttons on the encoder. So we can set the altimeter to the MSL pressure. We're going to click on that. We're going to click start scanning and then press in. Let me make sure we got that. And press in to validate. Now that the encoders are programmed, let's go ahead and program the toggle switch for our master battery. So to do that, we'll type in battery and then master battery. We'll click this for master battery on. Make sure that the toggle is in the off position. We're gonna then hit start scanning. Also make sure that your action type is on press. We're gonna turn the toggle on and then back off again. Now we can hit validate. The last thing I wanna program is the push button. So we're gonna type in brakes. We're gonna to toggle parking brakes start scanning, and press our push button. Validate, hit apply and save, go back. All right, so we should be all set to go. Now, if I press the push button, it sets our parking brake. If I toggle our batteries. It was at this moment that he knew he fucked up. Okay, so I had a little issue with the battery master switch when I had first set it up. So let me show you how I had configured it now so that it operates properly. For master battery on, we're gonna set it to our toggle. We're gonna to scan, press our toggle, make sure it says on press, and then validate. The next thing we'll do is set master battery. We'll click that. We're going to click on scan, flip our switch, flip it back off, and we're going to select on release. Hit validate save, go back, resume, and now if I turn on my battery, battery's on, battery's off. Perfect. Got our parking brake, let's turn our batteries on. Let's go to our heading dial. All right, so I wanna go over a little tip with you for setting up the rotary encoder pulse width. If you find that after you get in the cockpit and you're turning the heading dial, you can see how slow that heading dial is moving. What we wanna do is to lower the pulse width. And if you lower that pulse width, now you can see that the dial is speeding up. If you go too low, then it will start skipping. So you just wanna keep playing with this until you find the setting that's gonna work best for your encoders. And again, that's why you want to make sure all the encoders are the same so you don't have a problem between any of the different encoders. Now let's go ahead and turn the altimeter knob and you should see the barometric pressure start to change. Now I also had the press set to MSL, so there you go. So as you can see, everything on the button box is customizable within Microsoft Flight Simulator. We do not need any auxiliary software like MobiFlight, FSU IPC, SPAD. You don't need any of that. All of this is completely configurable within Microsoft Flight Simulator directly. Now, if you want to use those other software to configure your buttons to give you more flexibility, you can surely do that as well, too. All right, so that's going to finish us up with the easy DIY button box. If you have any comments or questions, post them down below in the comments section and I'll get right back with you. Thanks very much for joining us on the channel. And if you haven't done so, make sure to hit that subscribe, tick on that little bell, and smash that thumbs up button. To all of my Flight Simmer friends around the world, keep the blue side up and we will see you on the next one. Thanks for watching everybody.